um, I can slice on ECX and I can see ECX actually came from adding two um, heat pointers together. So, you know, usually you don't add heat pointers together. It doesn't really, not a good thing to do. And when you do, things crash. And that's, so I already found out just by, by doing one slice where, what the sort of underlying problem was. And uh, another point is this, this address that's, that's twice a heat pointer is actually reachable by heap spray. So this is something we can actually probably exploit. So yay, one point for, for Bitmaster. And poor Dion has no points. Okay. So, so then the next thing is like, okay, that, that sort of gives me an idea of what went wrong. Now, uh, what, what's up with the CF and the C1? Why was that important? So, uh, so, so then the, what I do is I figure out, okay, well, well, the crash was in cool type. So let's see the first time a tainted instruction was used in cool type. See if I can figure out what went wrong. So the first two are, are irrelevant because it's, it's writes on top of tainted data. So the first time a tainted, tainted byte was used was this E4 was read. Um, so it's like E4, huh, that's interesting. Like that's not C1 or CF. I wonder where that came from. So you can do the alignment trick and see what it was in the good case. And it's in the good case, instead of E4, it was D4. And you'll notice that uh, this E4 and the D4 are, are both tainted, as you would, you would expect. Okay, so, so it's like, huh, well, you know, where did, where did that come from? And so to, to see where the, the E4 came from, you need to trace back before it got into the, the crashing DLL cool type. So if you just look at a few instructions before that, you'll see it came from a big copy. So from some, it looks like it was inside memcopy or something. And you'll see it came from a buffer with like E4, 9B, 0, 0, and so forth. So uh, we can use the state reader to just grab memory near there. So if you do that, you'll see, you'll grab a bunch of memory. There's my E4 that's, that, that's there. And it, you see things like loca, max, p, name. If you just do a Google on that, you'll see that this is a true type font. Um, and then you can, you can use state reader also to say, are there any other bytes nearby tainted? Nope, E4 is the only tainted byte, it tells me. So I know that this is probably whatever I had before in the PDF, it was compressed, it got decompressed into this, and that one byte that was tainted before got changed into an E4 in the, in the decompressed stream. Well, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to win, right? Uh, no, actually, not this time. So Dion, meanwhile, sitting in the ISC headquarters, he, he decompressed the good font. And then he, uh, he examined the decompressed font. So, okay, okay he has the, the decompressed font. And then he looked in the crashed file in the heap to see where he could find something that looked similar to the, the decompressed font. And he found a, a spot in memory that looked exactly like the decompressed spot, font, except guess what? It, it was different in one byte. He saw that the, uh, the, you know, it was, instead of a E4, there was a D4. So he was able to pull that out from the debugger to get the, what the decompressed bad font was, because you can't actually just decompress the, the bad PDF because it's, it's corrupted. Um, so anyway, so he was able to like really quickly just by do, like searching memory and, and being smart, uh, figure out what the, the decompressed font was. So he gets a point for that. Well done, Dion. Okay, so, so round three, uh, Dion continues while I'm still like slicing and stuff. Uh, so, so he, he starts reading the, the true type font specification, which is something I would avoid if you could. So, uh, so he realizes, he's like, well, what's his E4 thing, right? I, I'm going to figure out in the spec what it, what it corresponds to. And what it corresponds to is an offset to where you can find this max P guy. So uh, in, the, in the good file, it's E4. In the bad file, it's D4. So they're, they're looking at different spots. Um, so, you, so you end up using a different max P table. And uh, the, the, the main difference that, that, that is, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the real underlying problem is that for, uh, in, in the good file, there's this FFFF there in this table, but it's, it corresponds to max size of instructions. Um, in the, because everything is shifted now, in the bad file, instead of that, the FFFF becomes max component points. And it turns out that's bad. So, uh, so what Dion does next is he creates a new PDF that's not compressed, so it, it has an uncompressed font, and then he manually makes max component points FFFF. And what he finds is then Adobe Reader still crashes in the exact same way, but now we have you know, a very small PDF, it's uncompressed, and we know exactly what's wrong. So it's the same crash, but now it's easier to analyze. You know, he's, he's starting to like kick my ass, so we need, we need to start improving, or else you'll be like, well, I'm just going to hire Dean, I'm not going to even use BitBlaze. So now I, I go back to BitBlaze. So I have the simpler PDF now. So now I take the simpler PDF that's uncompressed and I now, I now taint the FFFF. 
and I see what happens. So instead of taining the CF from the compressed font, I'm rerunning everything with the FFFF tainted to see what happens. Okay. So uh, I do the same exact thing again. I say, okay, tell me what instructions were dealt with tainted data and they were um, inside of the cool type DLL. That's what that grub is for. And right off the bat, the very first lines, it starts to tell me how this FFFF gets used. So first it reads the, the sixth byte of offset, reads that in the DH, and then the seventh byte. So it's reading not just, it's reading both of those FFs, so they're both important. And then what's it do? So th now they're in DX. And then do 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 down there, it, it uh, adds eight to it. Okay, that's fine. So it's FFFF plus eight. Um, so it's 107. And it pushes that to some function. But then what does a function do? Oh no, it thinks that it's a word and it copies it into ESI. And so instead of being 1007, it's now just seven. That's, that's an integer overflow. So, and, and I was able to find that real quick. So two to two, it's a, it's a tie. Right, that's the, the, the nice way to always end a talk. Um, so, uh, so then what, 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 what's the end of the story? And this, the, this is all outlined in the actual white paper, but I don't have time here. So this FFFF we saw had eight added to it. It overflowed. And then it uses this for an allocation size. So uh, it multiplies by four to get the size, because it's like D words. Uh, so the size in the bad file is one C. It's way too small. 11 buffers are allocated to this size, and then routines start operating on these buffers. They think the buffers are really big, like 40,000 bytes big, but really they're like, you know, 30 bytes big or something, I don't know. Um, and so they all smash on each other and, and then you get, you get crashes and stuff. So, that, so that's the bug. And we were able, you know, it was, it, that's the competition. But then it was like, you know, I, I said it's a nice way to end talks, but I'm not really that kind of person. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna have a winner, right? I'm an American, we can't have ties. So, uh, so, so the next thing was, Dion, he actually goes, and so BitBlaze can't do this. So he actually writes, you know, he, 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 um, he does the heap spray, he gets everything running, and you know, so, he, so uh, you can't argue with that. Dion is the winner this time. But still, uh, BitBlaze did good. Okay, so uh, got a couple minutes to finish up here. Um, let's talk about it a little bit. So, so BitBlaze did like pretty awesome on these things. Uh, you know, uh, it's still not gonna replace Dion at this point, but it, you know, hopefully it, it sped up the process. And there's some things that, that BitBlaze did that if, if we wouldn't, you know, we were still sort of working together, that if I wouldn't have shown him, oh, this is where this came from or that where it came from, it would have taken him a lot longer. Okay, so the trade-offs. BitBlaze, I already said this, it's not fast, so it's something you have to basically run overnight to get the traces. Um, there's also some things it can't do because it runs out of memory, so like uh, if you want to do full taint runs for those crash reports with taint, uh, sometimes you run into problems. You, the traces are sometimes many, many gigabytes, so you gotta have like a big hard drive ready to go. And uh, again, the, the bottom line I think is that it might not be faster, like if you said, Charlie Miller, you need to find, uh, you know, exploit for this bug in the next two hours. Like BitBlaze probably wouldn't be the tool for me. Uh, because in clock time it's not really faster. But if it's like, okay, you got, you have a week to do it, and you have 10 of them to do, well then it's probably a, a good choice because it's gonna be able to, you know, I can run it overnight and then it'll, it'll help me while I'm actually thinking about it go faster. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, BitBlaze is a general tool that, that can do lots of things. Uh, in particular, it can do this crash analysis. Uh, crash analysis is tough and even with taint information, it, uh, there's a lot of times you don't know what to make of, of, of crashes. Uh, but it is, something that, that will hopefully speed up your reverse engineering. The white paper, like I said, it's like 70 pages. It's full of gory detail. Check it out. Uh, code's available too. This is, this is the BitBlaze team. So I, you know, they, they were great. They, they, uh, they did a great job. Their tool works. Um, and so here's links to the code where you can, you can get BitBlaze and, and play with it yourself. Also links to the slides from today and, and the white paper. So um, please check it out. Um, and that's it. So uh, I don't know if we have, we have like three minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to, to take them. Yeah. yeah, back here. Yep. So this is a guy who had his picture in the slide, so he thinks he can ask a question. It's Ben, right? I think I can't really see, but I think so. I recognize his, his accent. 
So he's the guy who finds like 200,000 crashes in a word. Okay. What's your question? Is that right? So he, so he was asking what can be automated and what can't. So uh, you can certainly automate the trace taking. You can automate uh, the, the crash dumps that have taint information. And then you could write little heuristics on top of that. Um, uh, you, you can automate like some valve set stuff. So like if you notice things are, are tainted that at, at the crash site, you can ask how much control you have over those things. Um, but like knowing you could automate a slice but it wouldn't really do you any good probably because it sort of takes a human to interpret that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things you can do but, th but then the sort of figuring out the bug part still it, it's going to take a human to, to look at that. Yeah, back in there. Maybe I'm... No, there uh, how, how come? And how hard, how hard to bring that on, on stream? All right, so the question is uh, how hard is it to support Windows 7? No. <laughs> Right, so for the Windows platforms, of course, we don't have the source code, and for getting this operating system level semantic information, we need to sort of get deep into the internals of the system. So it involves sort of manually reverse engineering the kernel, and we just don't have the bandwidth right now, but that's sort of the next step. So, so it's, not a, it's not a QE-based limitation from the old code base we're using. Correct. So it's just so QMU might support Windows 7, but we need additional information not provided by QMU. That's where it, the TMU extension comes in, and so it's not that it's not possible to do, it's just that we haven't done that yet, and we have no need because all the samples can run fine in 2000 and XP. Right? But it's on, it's on our to-do list. Thank you. Is BitBlaze free? I didn't, I didn't see it. I came in late, so is it free and open, or is yes. that an enterprise yes. so product? BitBlaze is free, first of all. The core components of BitBlaze are open source, and you can find those at our website. We've also released binary-only versions of some of the tools that we've shown in this presentation, and you can get the distribution from that uh, at this link. So it's all free, some open source, some still closed source, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Most of it is open source. There's just a few tools that we haven't yet released publicly. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Right. The whole OS and uh, The trace files we were looking at were for just a single process, but the the trace collection utilities can I'll put traces for every process. Okay. So, thanks. All right. So you so you get a trace for the the, the process that, that that crashed or whatever, and then you can actually also just find out the instructions from that trace even finer are the only the ones that deal with tainted data. You can ask it that too. But uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about all the processes. That's one of the things that it does for you. Other questions? I think we're out of time anyway. So uh, thanks everybody.